Thanks for joining me today. Uh, I want to hear where you're from, uh, how long you've been playing the oud for, and what your interest in takasim is. Perhaps what is your greatest struggle struggle right now in terms of takasim? I've got some really bright lighting here, so the lighting may change from time to time. Uh, hope you can all hear and see me well. Please let me know. Um, yeah, anything anything you want me to know, any questions you have about Taksim, now's the time you can get them out. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my perspective on improvisation, Takasim, and uh, a new shortcut to learning, or a new tool to learning the art of Taksim, which I want to share with you uh, today, and what that's all about. So, yeah. Let's uh, get into it. So a, f a little bit about my background in, in improvisation, in learning music. Um, I primarily studied music with private lessons, one-on-one -on -one private lessons. And I started learning Persian music on Santur. And um, back in those days, I was just, you know, 10 years old or so learning santur and back then i didn't really have a concept of different scales different things I, you know certain things i just liked the way they sound sounded um i didn't really have a sense of what is a different uh scale or or what have you um it took me a lot of time to develop that awareness um and later on you know i dabbled in playing guitar i played uh, played trombone throughout high school in in concert and jazz band um you know but i always was continuing to play santur throughout that off and on um but santur was my primary education in music and that's what i basically learned how to play music and learn how to read notes with and so that was my you know the the building blocks for my foundation in music education um back then i didn't really know any theory at all it was just learning repertoire and learning uh, the radif the in persian music we have uh, the radif which is uh, their melodies their melodies that have been passed on from generation to generation and they they really accurately describe the modal tradition of persian music um we'll get to that in, in a little bit but these are some, some of the things that uh, have really created the foundation for uh, my perspective on takasim improvisation when it comes to Persian music, Arabic music, Turkish music, and it's kind of shaped my framework. Um, I'll never forget the, the first the first while that I started really improvising, trying to improvise in Persian music. Um, I had a good friend who played tombak. We would spend a lot of time together um, just playing songs we knew and uh, jamming along. Um, this was back when I was in high school. Uh, we'd just be, you know, jamming stuff um and you know i'd get tired of playing the same songs over and over so i experimented with improvising and it was very strange at first because you, you don't really know what you're doing when you first improvise um and i remember at one point you know i'm 
playing with my friend during the day and you know mom's just in the kitchen and uh she's listening to this the whole time and at one point she says she says why don't you play some real daska daska is the the term for makam in persian music so uh the modal uh, system I, and i didn't really know what i i was kind of getting frustrated because i didn't know what she meant by real daska what's 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 different about what i play here when i play a, somebody else's composition with me fooling around playing you know whatever melodies i'm playing and uh, i didn't really get it at that point and i didn't really know you know what to do at that at that point i was just experimenting and i think everyone who improvises who starts to improvise has to go through this um trial and error you have to find out what works and you're going to continue going through this trial and error for the rest of your uh musical life I know I still am, and I'm still, we're always trying to find new ways, new pathways, new melodies that we can add to our repertoire. Sometimes they work, and sometimes they don't. Um, and one of the methods that I basically started to learn was the radif. The radif, of course, is those non-rhythmical melodies that are passed down from generation to generation. And we actually have, like, you can get a book of these melodies. And you have to learn one-on-one -on -one through a teacher as well through the notes. But you have to have a teacher because you can't. it's difficult to interpret um, the notes and how they're actually put together, what the phraseology is. Um, you know, they're written in standard musical notation, but you have to have them interpreted. And so what these melodies are is basically you internalize them, you memorize them to some degree, and they become part of you. For example, um, I can... You know, play for you the introductory melody in Daska of Mahur, for example. Introduction of Mahur. This is a melody that's been composed and passed down in the Radhi. And it teaches you something. It's a, it teaches you how to produce melody, what the opening is. This is the opening. It's always the opening. You start here in this zone. Um, we call each of these melodies gushes or niches. So it's melodic niche and it, it shows some feature. It may have several features, but anyway. Um, after you go through these and you memorize them, they become part of you. And that's how you learn how to improvise. And we use these. You take this melody and you reflect on it. You elaborate on it. And you turn it into your own melody after time, after you perfect your art and you practice over and over. And you try to embellish certain parts. You take away. You add. So, But you follow this particular contour or these certain essential features of each of these melodic niches and that's how you eventually learn to improvise in Persian music um, another way that uh, I used to learn how to improvise was or when I was trying starting to learn these melodies um, I would put on Muhammad Reza Shajarian's you know Avaz where he's just singing and, and reciting poetry and there would be maybe one instrument copying his melody or um, call and response, uh, saws or avaz, instrument and singing. And I would basically try to copy what he was doing on the santur. Um, and so he, you know, he would sing a melody, and then I would try to copy it. And this was basically ear training. Um, I didn't know it at the time, and I didn't know any theory at the time. But I was copying these melodies, and eventually I was able to kind of piece together. Okay. Kind of tend to start here, tend to go here, tend to do this, tend to pause here, and then you finish here. And that's kind of how you learn when you're doing it yourself or when you 
uh, learn it in a certain tradi tradition without formal education kind of way of learning, um, you kind of get these connections or you see these connections happening. Um, so basically, that is another method, learning melodies, copying them over and over. And so that's another thing. Um, later on, after I felt like uh, I had good sense, a good level of mastery in Persian music, I started to dabble in Arabic and Turkish music and start to um, try to adapt those styles into my own playing. Um, and one of the things I noticed was uh, they don't have a ragi in Arabic and Turkish music. Um, so I wondered, you know, how do they create melodies? And that, that's another good question. How do you create melodies? Where does melody come from? Um, is it just something that, that we pass on? Is there something concrete from where melodies come from? Is it, you know, is it wired into our brains? Is it wired into the music itself? These are all, you know, questions that you kind of come across. What makes one melody catchy and another one not so catchy? Um, so th these are kind of questions that come into um, learning maqams, learning improvisation. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that I uh, came across as I continued to develop and learn Arabic music, Turkish music, and all that. Uh, one thing is that until this point, until about, uh, let's say, 2008, maybe 2009, I didn't know anything about m much about theory. Um, I would, but I could still improvise in Persian music and to do it fairly well. But I didn't know anything about theory. You don't really need to know formal theory in order to play this music. Um, and but once you do learn it, it does help you teach it. it. Does help you give you some things that you can convey in a different type of in a different format. But theory can only take you so far. Because it doesn't, ultimately, it doesn't reflect practice. There's always exceptions. There's always musicians doing something different. Um, and really, we only need to know a few things about the theory in order to have a basis in order to play makam, or play daska, or play modes. Um, yeah. Then there's another method um, called ear training. Ear training is really great because... Um, it's more of an intuitive, more of an organic, more of a human conversational way of learning how to improvise. And, but it's more of a, like a subliminal kind of learning of improvisation. Because you got to do it a lot. It takes time. You got to, these, the intonation, the maqams, they have to kind of sit with you. You have to get to know them for over a longer period of time. Then you can start to do it yourself. You start to see the patterns, and that's really where it starts to come through. Um, but it doesn't really, and ear training doesn't really answer the question of where do melodies come from. It is a solid method to learn melodic vocabulary uh, that help you tap into a specific tradition. So, for example, uh, all the melodic vo vocabulary of Persian music can be found in the different radifs that are taught. So you can learn those things. You can tap into that tradition. You can play a specific style that's specific to that way of playing. Um, with Arabic music, you have to do the same thing. You have to uh, learn from the source, from songs, from people improvising. You learn from teacher to teacher. And uh, so you do that as you learn melodies. But a good question came across over time was, you know, what, are, what makes the melody authentic? What makes it sound Arabic? What makes it sound Turkish? What makes it sound Persian? And these are hard to, hard to you know, put into words. Um, so over time, um, I've explored different tools. Um, one thing that I've explored over time to learn and teach Makams um, and how to improvise is to Write out somebody's taksim or create your own taksim and write out note for note so you can copy and get the techniques. Um, that's one way that works. It works fairly well, but you run into a trap. You don't want to keep playing the same reiteration of the same melody over and over. But one thing I did realize, uh, observing different people's taksim, um, is that 
you tend to hear the same things. They they play the same licks in the same form. Maybe they change it here and there, or they connect it in a different way. But if you go and listen to um, a whole bunch of Farid al Atrash Taksim, you'll notice that he's recycling the same material over and over. And there is a place for that, and it does make sense, and everyone re recycles their own material from time to time. You can hear it in every Oud player's Taksim. You can you can hear it. They're recycling material. I re I recycle a lot of material, um, and this is what I mean by vo uh, melodic vocabulary that you can hear and you can learn, you can absorb, bring into your own, you know, music, and you can play it a certain way. Um, so that's one thing: uh, writing out a taksim, studying it note for note, and learning how to play. It. That's great for learning the technique, uh, how to wear and how to do the tremolo, the droning. This kind of thing. It's great for learning those little details in the taxi. Um, but you may not really be thinking about what the melody is doing and what's happening. So there's other ways like analyzing taxi where you think about where the melody is going, what the melodic contour is. And for anyone who's learning who wants to learn takasim, I sometimes direct them to listen to all these different Farid al Atrash takasim because he's doing the same thing over and over. And you can create a formula or contour for his um, takasim and you can see what he does here and there. Um, so um, another thing that I've, that I've written out at certain times is I've analyzed the sayir of different uh, for people's takasim. For example, um, sayir is the word for pathway, um, and it's it's basically where you go, where you start, where you pause, where you develop the melody, where you modulate, and where you come back, or where you finish, where you conclude. And uh, so that's another way. Um, but the problem with uh, sayir is that um, it's not always consistent, and so you you will find different ways of doing doing things. You'll find different uh, things. You'll find musicians who experiment and do something that's a little bit, you know, out there. Maybe it's not something that you hear often. And so Sayer can change. And, and uh, there's been arguments that have said that uh, Sayer has changed over time. And definitely it has. You can see that in Turkish music. Um, you can analyze an old composition from older Ottoman era period in Turkish music that's said to be so-and-so maqam. And if you analyze the modern, uh, if you look at a modern composition in well, so-and-so maqam, you'll see that the melody has changed. Maybe it focuses more on different aspects. And uh, one maqam in particular is uh, maqam bozor, or buzur in, uh, in Turkish music. It seems to have changed over time. If you listen to a composition from uh, Dmitri Kantemir from that period in his Makam Berserk, uh, and you listen to a more uh, modern, uh, maybe a couple of centuries later, uh, composition in Makam Berserk, you'll see that the melody has a different character. Um, related, but different character. You can also see that um, in older, peri older periods, the way that they played. Um, Makam Sika or Sega was different um, from the modern period. The Sika note. Now, uh, back in back in the olden times, they wouldn't play this melody. They would play more of a. They would play the open string. Times in modern times in Turkish rep repertoire, you really hear this a lot. Whereas in older um, compositions, you didn't hear as often. So those are some examples on how things change from time to time. Um, so there's a drawback to learning Sayer. You know, you don't have to follow it that that way all the time. You don't have to follow a certain pathway all the time. Um, then uh, what I came up with uh, recently, in, in one of my students suggested that I write out, you know, like a 
a little outline of Taksim for my Makam Mastery Program. And I thought, that's a great idea because um, you can use it as a template. Uh, related to Seir, Seir is kind of like a template too. But uh, what I'm going to be doing is uh, designing um, some templates, Taksim templates that you can use to identify the key uh, melodic niches that occur in a, in a particular maqam, where the melody goes, what the direction of the melody is, whether it you know, ascends, tends to ascend, or whether it tends to descend. You can see that in the template. What notes are the focus notes of the melody, the tonal gravity is what we call it. You know, for example, um, uh, in, in Mahur that I was playing at the beginning of this, the tonal gravity is around C. And then it goes elsewhere. It refers to this note below C. Then you can pause on here and create a tonal center around the second degree of the mo. degree so you can see these things happening in the in the template so it'll give you like a guide that you can follow something that you can look at and think about as you're improvising using simple melody um, and then you can also what the template's also going to be doing is to show you the different uh, modes within the greater mode that you're playing so for example if you're playing uh, bayat uh, on D. Often what you'll hear is a focus on the tonal gravity to the B flat, the, the sixth. What this tends to do, it tends to bring out the hidden um, little niche that you have there, which is something that's very akin to Aja. From F. And then the way that you play it makes it sound authentic or not, how you do it. But the template can actually show you, uh, okay, we're, we're focusing on this note, this pausing note, to create a tonal gravity around this note that will show a shift in your melodic development. Then how it develops from there and eventually how it concludes. So there are different things that you can you'll be able to see in this template, and I'm just going to be writing them out in normal notation um, with some notes, so you can see which uh, jins or ajnas uh, we are focusing on, what tetrachord in in that's uh, in the makam that we're looking at, um, and I'm going to be doing a workshop on it uh, next week. Um, the workshop link, if you're interested in joining, it is in the description of the. YouTube channel here or the description of the YouTube video. Um, so check that out. If you're interested, I'll be sharing with you um, this Taksim uh, template that I've devised. And uh, you'll have, uh, we'll go through a workshop talking about how to approach a Makam using language of metaphor. Metaphor is really important to help us understand what we're doing in a, in a Taksim and what we're trying to do, what we're doing with different notes. So we'll be using language of meta metaphor to kind of describe what is happening in a taksim. And then we'll use this template uh, to outline our taksim and to establish what we're doing in a taksim so that you get a flow uh, and an idea. And at the end of the workshop, you have some material, some melodies that I'll be showing you, simple melodies, with the template that you can use to devise your own takasim. So um, I invite you to check out the link. Uh, all the description there is there. The, it's going to be happening on Zoom. Um, let me just uh, check the date here when that is. And I'd be happy to answer any of your questions related to oud playing or takasim, whatever you like.
So if you have any questions, get them out in the chat and I will get to them. Fix this up here. All right. So there's going to be two, um, two workshops. Get this here. So there's going to be two workshops. One is for Eurasian time zones. One is for American time zones so that everyone can hopefully something will be appropriate for the, your time zone. Uh, the Eurasian time zone will be Saturday, uh, November 27th. And uh, depending on your time zone, uh, American time zone, it'll be Sunday, November 28th. Uh, and uh, you can check uh, on that link in the description. I'll put it in the chat for you to check out too. There it is. And so check out the dates there. Um, and you can check that out. You'll have to, um, first you'll have to enroll. Um, and then you'll get access to the course. And you'll register your free account on the website. And then uh, you'll get access to the course. It'll say Axiom Workshop. You click there and then you'll see the Zoom registration link that you must uh, click on and register so that you gain access to the Zoom meeting. Um, so a few steps there in order to actually do it. Um, but you can always email me if you have questions about this. Here's the link to the course. And uh, here's my email address. All right. So I'll answer an easy question uh, first. Um, sandpaper my oud peg so they don't slip so easy. That's a good question. Um, I don't know if I would if I would sand them because that may um, that may make the that may make the peg a little bit more narrow, and it might not fit quite in your in the peg hole. Um, what you should do if uh, if you're having trouble with the pegs slipping is you should, uh, especially if the weather is dry, uh, you may need to push them in a little bit. Maybe unwind it a little bit and then push each peg in and then do fine tuning. Um, and that that's what I usually do. I never touch the pegs unless you know it's a is that it's a like a repair or something that I have to do, and I even then I would find a professional to do it. Um, but some people do have, I've heard that some people have success with chalk, uh, putting chalk on the, on the pegs. Uh, you could, you could look into that. Uh, that might work. But usually I just try to push the peg in a bit, a bit more when they're loose. But it depends on type of pegs you have and uh, if any compound, peg compound has been added to it might be more slippery than other. Uh, can I tune a fog horse to sole, or is it too much tension? That's a good question too. I, I, it might be too much tension. Um, usually, if you want to tune fa up to sole or F to G, you would get a specific set for that. Um, for that, um, there used to be a tuning that Jamil Bashir used. Um, and his was, he was tuning sol to sol. So his lowest uh, note was a sol. His highest note was a sol, even higher than fa fa. Um, he used that. Nobody really uses that anymore. Um, so yeah, you'd have to get a specific string set. You could try, um, but it might be too much tension. Um, and it, yeah, I don't know um, if that would be uh, such a great idea, especially if you have a, if you have a floating uh, bridge oud, it shouldn't be no it should be no problem because the pressure is being pushed on the on the neck rather than the the fixed bridge which is pulling on the sound. 
a higher tension is usually okay for floating uh, bridge oop. But if you have a, a fixed bridge, then I might not recommend. Could try, but it might be dangerous. Uh, could you comment a bit about mixing of Bayati on Re and Rost on Do, like changing between B flat and B half flat? Okay, that's a really good question. Of course, uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay. So I'm gonna first try to do a taksim, and I'm gonna try to do that myself without thinking about it. Just let the melodies come and see what happens. Then I'll tr try to talk about reanalyze what I did. things that I did there. First, just started out in Bayat. Later on, developed some melodies, did some things, made some statements. And then later on, I used the Rost tetrachord. Right now, I'm tuned to uh, Sol on the bass string, which I forgot about that. melody here and then but I then kept on going back to D to emphasize the root of Bayat and then I kind of played with moving the, the tonal gravity to C Eventually made my way down, used the melody that brought me down to Rost, C, and then started playing melodies that are characteristic of Rost, which really bring you in there and solidify that Rost feeling, that flavor. Do it. 
let's uh, let me try again. I'll go from Bayat into Rast, and maybe I'll find a different way to do it, a different path. section in Bayati, now I went to the fifth. This is something like Husseini. Husseini uses B half flat. Now you can use Husseini as a bridge. Characteristic of Mokam Raf there. Then you gotta you gotta force that melody on the listener. You have to force it by supporting it. And make more melodies that pause on C to really force that happening. Establish that uh, Rast feeling. And then you go back. Uh, then you're in Rast. So you're in, you can do anything in Rast, anything that connects to Rast. Uh, you can go back into Bayati if you like. You can do whatever you want. So those are some ideas that you could work with. If you have any other questions, please let me know. I'll uh, give you a few minutes. If you have any questions, any questions about the workshop I'm doing or what have you, happy to answer. <laughs>
improvising there. Um, and, you know, sometimes you find melodies that work. Sometimes you find melodies that don't. Sometimes melodies can take you places that work really well. And sometimes, you know, it just doesn't. It doesn't work at all. So you got to always experiment. Always have that. Always listen to what other players are doing. See if you like that. If you don't like it, don't do it. If you like it, try to make it part of your own playing. enjoyed thanks uh, for coming andrew uh thanks for your question salik um thanks so much uh, for joining me today guys and uh ch do check out the workshop if you're interested and um if you have any other questions that i couldn't answer today please feel free to email me always good to see you guys on here thanks uh, really glad you enjoyed salik thank you um yeah so have a great rest of your evening and uh, we'll hopefully we'll see you in the workshop. Thanks. Bye.